My name is Ryan, I'm 26 years old, and God saved me. So I grew up in a professing Christian home. I was in church from the time I was born. I grew up in church, all the vacation Bible schools, every Sunday uh, morning, Sunday evening, every Wednesday night, all the summer camps and programs and everything. And then when I was seven years old, I prayed the sinner's prayer, accepted Jesus into my heart, and I was baptized four days later. I was a good child based on the world's standards. Um, people would have said I was a good all-American boy and I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to do. I honored my parents for, for some years after that. Went to church, continued after praying the sinner's prayer and everything, and. And when I was about 14 years old or 15 years old, I, I realized that there was more out there than the church. So I, I decided to give everything up that I was living for at the time to go live in the world. For the next three or four years I lived in the world. I enjoyed all the desires of the flesh. I didn't hold back anything. I could go on and list many sins that I committed, many things that I did, and some of you may like to hear those things, but it won't do any benefit to tell people all of the sins that I committed in the dark. I realized my life was going down the drain and I was headed to hell fast. Still thought I was saved all those years. Going to youth camps all those years while living in the world all the youth programs and church still every Sunday, every Wednesday, professing Christ while loving my sin. I knew I was in trouble. I knew my life was messed up, but I thought I was saved. All along, the pastors, the friends, the family, people would tell me, you're a Christian, you need to act like a Christian. They would say that I was going to lose my eternal rewards in heaven, but by God, once saved, always saved. That there was nothing I could do to lose those things. Here I was, a child of the wrath of God, a son of the devil, according to Scripture. And people in the church are telling me that I'm safe. I'm sealed by the Spirit of God. I'm born again, and I need to live like it my life had no testimony of Christ. So realizing all these things, about 19 or 20 years of age, I, I did a self-reform, self-help by the own power of my flesh. I cut out a lot of uh, public outward sins in my life, traded them off for pride, became ab even more abominable before God. God's wrath burned against me even more then because instead of living in the world and, and having all these outward sins, it was, it was pride. Traded it all for pride. Lived in the secret sin of lust. Nobody knew what I did but behind closed doors. But God knew. And His wrath was being stored up for me over and over and over again. I would even read the Bible all those years, I would pray. I thought I was saved. I thought that I thought that, that Christ had actually done something in my life. Every year, youth camp, go to youth camp, get all stirred up emotionally, and then I would, two weeks later, I would think, well, I, I gotta get back there again. Can't wait till next year. It wasn't of God, it was all false. But there came a day when through the reading of God's Word, a light went off. My eyes were opened. I could see clearly. I had pain in my heart for my sin. 
I, I actually didn't want it anymore. I didn't desire it anymore. I actually love the Word of God in a real way. All the things I heard about Christ, how Jesus died on the cross, we're all sinners, we need to be saved, so just pray the sinner's prayer and accept Jesus. I realized it was a superficial gospel. God showed me that there's, there's no such thing as accepting Jesus. Such a thing as a foreign notion to the Word of God. There, there's nothing, we don't receive Jesus, we, we don't ask Jesus to come into our hearts. There's nothing that we can do to persuade Jesus to come and live inside of our ugly, black, dead, sinful heart. He doesn't want anything to do with it. But I was lied to and told the complete opposite my whole life. Just accept Jesus. Ask Him to come into your heart. If you ask Him, He'll come in if you're sincere enough. That's what I was always told. But that's not, that's not how it is. Scripture says our hearts are perverse, they're wicked, they're deceitful. It says we have a heart of stone by nature. And God isn't going to come into a heart like that. He rips it out of our chest and He puts a new heart in there. God wants nothing to do with our natural heart. I looked at the Scriptures and after God saved me, it all became so clear that when God saves a person, He doesn't only save us from the consequence of sin, which is His wrath and hell, but He saves us from the power of sin. Sin will not any longer have reigning dominion over us. Though we sin as Christians, God prunes us, He disciplines us, and we bear fruit. When we sin as a Christian, we have the discipline of Almighty God and it grieves us in our heart that we sin against Him and we cannot make a practice of sinning. That's what the Scriptures say. We cannot continue to live a lifestyle of habitual sin. Because if we do that, God's seed doesn't abide in us and we never knew Him. People would tell me that I had accepted Jesus as Savior but I needed to accept Him as Lord such a stupid lie the wolves in sheep's clothing that's what that's what they were telling me that's what they were if we accept Jesus as anything for lack of a better phrase he will be Lord of our life he doesn't want one day a week he doesn't want two days a week if we don't come to God if we don't come to Jesus every day of the week then he doesn't want anything to do with us that's the heart of God God's heart says to us if you don't come to me every day don't even bother I don't want anything to do Jesus commands everything he wants total abandonment total sacrifice and he will not receive anything less and that's what it's all about there's not different groups of Christians in the church. There's spiritual Christians. There are disciples. Anyone who is a child of God is a disciple. There's no higher class and lower class of Christian. There's no holier and less holy Christian. We're all children of God. We all have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are all being conformed into the image of Him. It's all about Christ. I was so deceived so many years. I would always wonder, why is so and so and so and so in the youth group? Why? Why do they profess Christ with so much passion for a few years? And now they're living in the world. And now they're sleeping with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Or now they're addicted to pornography. Or now all they talk about is stupid sports. Why don't they talk about God? What's going on? Why when this person goes off to college, they come back twice the son of hell as before? Why? And everybody would say, oh, it's, it's just because they need to accept Jesus as Lord. Or they would say they're carnal. They just need to rededicate their life to God. There's no such thing as rededicating one's life to Christ. If you open the Bible and you read it, these terms do not exist. Read the Bible. Don't listen to what the preacher says. Read the Bible. It doesn't matter what the preacher says. 
I don't care if he went to a Southern Baptist seminary. Read the Bible. The preacher's word is not the final authority. It's the word of God that is the authority, and that's what we have to listen to. If what your pastor says contradicts the word of God, he's a false teacher. Listen to what the word of God says, Titus 2. Starting in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. For what purpose? Verse 12, Training us to renounce ungodliness in worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. That's what Christ saves us for. To redeem a people for Himself who are zealous for good works. That's what's going to happen to us if we're saved. Then it says, declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. If a pastor or a preacher is not teaching these things to his congregation. He is leaving out a great part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we don't preach the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, then we have an incomplete gospel. A half truth is a lie. If we don't tell the whole truth, we get a lie. It's one thing to be deceived and misled about something small like your checkbook. You don't have your checkbook balanced the right way. Or you make some bad grades and you flunk out of college. That's one thing. It probably isn't going to have any eternal consequences. It's not going to send anyone to hell. It is another thing to be deceived and misled about what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to all those who believe. It's the power of God. It's not something small. It's a matter of life or death. But today we have this, this little sinner's prayer. The greatest heresy in the church in the United States of America and has spread throughout the entire world. And I can say based on the authority of the Word of God that no one has ever been saved because they prayed the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer has never nor will it ever save anyone. Sure, people who have prayed it may be saved. They weren't saved because they prayed a prayer. They were saved in spite of praying a prayer. Anyone who has been saved by God's grace has been saved by a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So if you wonder why people that you know in the church just never quite get there. They're always holding on to one or two or three things, sins that they just can't let go of. You wonder why children grow up in the church, depart during their high school and college years, and claim to rededicate their life and come back to Christ. You wonder why those things happen. It's because people are not saved. They have not been converted. They are unregenerate, void of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And to think of the fact that somebody can be in, in a, a Christian church, a professing Christian church, not a true Christian church like myself for 22 years, hear all the Bible stories, hear all the things, every Sunday, every Wednesday, an invitation, a sinner's prayer, asking somebody to raise their hand, just come down forward, play one more stanza. Somebody's out there. Jesus is calling softly and tenderly, just as I am, just walk down the aisle. He'll save you if you just pray this prayer and mean it. It's a lie. God's not calling softly and tenderly. He's screaming at the top of His lungs to repent. That's the message of the Scriptures. Don't be deceived. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not something to be mistaken about. Believing an adulterated and prostituted gospel has eternal consequences. The sinner's prayer will damn you to hell if that is what you trust in for salvation. 
And I can assure you, there are more people in hell right now because they trusted in a sinner's prayer than you can imagine. Christ is the way. He is the power. The cross, the gospel of Jesus is the power for salvation. We must preach it.